Well, the first time I heard the name Lee McBride, I was leading worship at a conference uh, somewhere. I used to do conferences a lot, and they introduced Lee as the comedian that they were bringing in to do a, a show, a comedy show as part of this conference and to do ministry. And it's the first time I'd ever heard him. It's the best comedy show I've ever heard in my life. Uh, and I said, man, we got to have this guy at our church. And so a few years ago, we invited him in to, to be the entertainment for our volunteer appreciation dinner that we do each year for all of our workers and volunteers. And it was amazing. But at the more I got to know Lee, I found out he was not just a professional comedian who's toured all over the world professionally doing comedy. He's also a preacher. He's an evangelist. He's a phenomenal storyteller. He hosts camps and conferences all over the country and all over the world. Uh, he has reached more people than I can imagine and as a powerful uh, ministry as you're going to find out and then recently found out he was available to come be with us today and so I'm so grateful to have Lee here. He's not only all those things I said by the way, he's become a great friend uh, to us personally and to Upcountry Church so would you help me welcome Lee McBride. Thank you my brother. Yes, sir. Love you man. It is so good to be here this morning. I'd rather be here than the nicest hospital in this part of South Carolina. Would you say amen? What about the newest jail? I'd rather be here than the newest jail because I would be in probably one of those two places without Jesus. That's probably where I'd be. So I'm thrilled to be here. I'm just going to be forthright and honest with you. I invited myself this morning. I was in Kannapolis yesterday and I said, I want to go to Up Country Church. So I reached out and was uh, uh, graciously given the opportunity to be with you this morning. And I'm here to share a story from the scripture that I think will bring you a little hope. And uh, maybe bring a little light in the darkness. Uh, storytelling is kind of what I do. It, and all those things that he said in that very, very kind introduction... Uh, basically, it's just storytelling, pointing people to Christ. Whether it's a youth camp, whether it's a water break at a high school, you know, a little five-minute talk to a football team, or whether it's a wild game supper, or a, whatever it is. Uh, that, 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 it's just using storytelling, the gift God gave me. I fell in love with storytelling at a very young age to point people to Christ. So I'm here this morning to share a story with you. I... Uh, I got my tables a little sad. I got a few hats left, but I got a little book back there that uh, a good friend of mine's wife, he, he pastors a Baptist church just outside of Nashville, Tennessee, and she, I've been looking for stuff to give people who just recently accepted Christ, uh, something that's, you know, well-written and, 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 and impactful, and she has a, written a fantastic book. Now, I, I said this morning at first service, they're as Baptist as John D. was in the Bible. They're Baptists. So it's, it's, the title of the book's a little, it says, Now That You're Baptized. But really, it's just for new believers. If you know somebody that's a new believer, I promise you it would be an excellent, excellent thing, a book to give them. So just grab one and give it to them. And there's a little donation bucket back there. If you want to put some in there, that's fine. If not, take one anyway. But let's pray. Lord, as we look to your word, we believe in a all our hearts that your word is powerful and living that it's, it's it gives us hope and uh, it's a simple little story Lord and I'm sure everybody that's been in church for very long has heard this story but Father I'm asking today that it'll hit home Father I'm asking today that it will it will minister to somebody here in this room Lord, we don't have to pray for your word to be anointed. You did that a long time ago. But I am praying that you would anoint our hearts. Lord, soften our hearts for what your word has for us this morning. Lord, it is a simple truth that the same sunshine that hardens red clay can melt red wax. So soften our hearts, prepare our hearts for what you have for us today. In your precious name we pray and everybody said. So Matthew chapter 26, verse 6, is a simple little story. And, uh, you know, if I ask everybody in this room today to give me a, a sincere, be, speak sincerely and tell me what your idea 
of beautiful is. We may get as many different answers as there are people here. Some of you ladies believe that on Saturday morning at the mall, when they begin to roll those doors and chains up and open those shopping, you think that's beautiful. I hate the mall. Nothing happens to a good a fat boy. Nothing good happens to a fat boy at the mall. I don't know if you know that, except that salty pretzel, that big soft pretzel at the food court. That's about it. Because let me tell you what happens to a fat guy at the mall. First of all, at some point, your wife is going to ask you to hold her purse. Do you know there's no manly way to hold a woman's purse on this earth? I've tried everything. I've tried to act like you're going to pull a spiral with a football, tuck it in your back pocket. It's just You just don't look right holding your wife's purse. Second thing is, you know, no matter how careful you are, the way they have stores arranged, I think stores are arranged funny. And if you're not paying attention, you're just walking, you'll find yourself in close proximity to somewhere you're not supposed to be, like the women's undergarments. When you're 6'4 and you weigh 350 and you're out in front of Victoria's, it ain't no secret. You know what I mean? It's a little bizarre. It's a little weird. <laughs> but, you know, we all have different ideas of what is beautiful. I don't know what you would consider beautiful, and I don't know that you would care too much what I consider beautiful, but when Christ calls something beautiful, I think that's worthy of our attention. You know, the Bible says that this life is just like a vapor. It's just here and gone. And the older I get, the truer that becomes to me. It's just here once, just for a, a second, just a flash. If we could do one thing in our life while we were here that Christ considers beautiful, I think our life on earth would be well worth it just for that one thing just for that one thing. So let's look at this simple little story. Matthew chapter 26, verse 6. I'm reading from the NIV this morning because that was our textbook in college. I'm not making any version statements. I'm just used to this one. Matthew 26, verse 6, NIV. When, while Jesus was in Bethany in the home of Simon the leper. All right, let's stop right there. We'll, we'll come back and finish, but we need to stop right there because really that scripture doesn't make sense. It doesn't make common sense. You say, Lee, are you, you calling? No, just hear me out. We have to do some more research because that, that doesn't compute. See, if you understand anything about leprosy in Matthew chapter 26, you would know why it doesn't compute. Now, we probably understand infectious disease at this point in our life better than we ever have. But I don't know if we know what it was like to be a leper in Matthew 26. You probably have heard about leprosy, and you probably understand what leprosy is. And there, believe it or not, there's still parts of the world where leprosy can be devastating, but we don't deal with it much. Matter of fact, there's only one critter. And this whole county's even got leprosy. Anybody know what it is? Say it again, armadillo. So run off the road and hit every one of them you see. Drag them home with a rope, set them on fire, and put them out, pour bleach on them. They are terrible, terrible, terrible critters. And if you're an animal lover and that bothers you, you can reach me at PastorRobRucci.com. I have no love in my heart for armadillos or coyotes. But anyway. We don't really deal with leprosy. But in Matthew chapter 26, verse 6, it was a big deal. Matter of fact, if you went to the high priest and you had a sore on your arm, a boil, and the, the high priest looked at it and he says, that's leprosy, and you were declared unclean, your life would change. They'd take your clothes, burn them, give you something special to wear so what people could see at sight that you were a leper. You could never touch anybody ever again. You couldn't go hug your spouse, your babies, your brother, your sister, your parents. Never touch them again. You couldn't drink from the same water source. You couldn't 
swim in the same streams. You couldn't bathe in the same river. Matter of fact, if you, if you research it, they, it was a mandate in Matthew 26 that if you had leprosy and you walked on a common road, you had to carry a noisemaker with you. And when you saw somebody coming, you had to either clang that bell or clack that sack of bone, whatever the noisemaker was, and you had to say three times loudly, unclean, 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 so that people would know you were a leper, so that they could keep their distance from you. Simon the leper. The reason Matthew 26 verse 6 doesn't make sense until we research it is because if Simon had leprosy, he wouldn't be at his house. And neither would they. But he's there. How is he there? Why is he there? Well, once you research, here's what you're going to find out. Because of a direct confrontation with Jesus Christ, what was unclean had been made clean. Has anybody else experienced that in their personal life? That because of Jesus Christ and the blood of Christ, in your life what was unclean has been made clean? Is there anybody else here that has been delivered by the blood of Jesus, set free by the blood of Jesus, washed by the blood of Jesus? It is a true fact. The first point of this story is the blood of Christ can make what is unclean clean. Now there's somebody else there. There's somebody else in this house. It's in a different part of the scripture. It's in John chapter 12. You can double check me. Who also had a physical ailment. His name was Lazarus. Does anybody remember Lazarus' physical ailment? What was wrong with Lazarus? Yeah, he was dead. Now y'all, bad as leprosy can be, being dead's worse than having leprosy. I don't know if you know that. It is. Being dead is tough when it comes to being a physical ailment. And I don't mean he'd been dead just a few seconds, you know, woke up and they wrote his story and a, 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 you know, talked about it in a podcast. I mean, he had been dead for days. Now, y'all can say what you want. That's weird. That's bizarre. What would you do if you came in this morning and saw somebody you had attended their funeral? That's weird. Don't you know they talked about him the rest of his life? They're like, that's him right over in that red tunic. Don't stare at him. That's him. He was dead. I went to his funeral. I mean, they're back there in the fellowship hall eating tater salad telling Lazarus stories. Dead. He was dead. It's really a very interesting story. And it gives us one of the most interesting scriptures in the Bible. Anybody in here besides me, raise your hand if you were in church as a child. Raise your hand. Anybody remember Vacation Bible School? Wave at me if you remember Vacation Bible School. Kids Crusade. Remember when you used to have to memorize scriptures and at the end of the week if you memorized your scriptures you got a prize? We had a treasure chest. Y'all remember the little treasure chest? It was full of all kind of goodies. And if you memorized all your scriptures, at the end of the week you got to go into the treasure chest. You know what I'm talking about. It had to have them little gliders. You remember the little balsa wood gliders you'd put together? and All kind of cool stuff, man. All kind of cool stuff. Well, the first, I went to every VBS in our town every year. And the first night, I, my scripture was memorized because it was the easiest scripture in the Bible to memorize because it was two words. Jesus wept. You can check Monday off. I'm good, man. I done got Monday took care of. Jesus wept. Well, that little two-word scripture is uh, descriptive of the Lazarus story. So here's what happened. Jesus and Lazarus were extremely close in their earthly relationship. Jesus had eaten at the table at Lazarus' house. They were friends. They were close. Jesus is out of town and Lazarus becomes ill, very ill, deathly ill. So they go for Jesus. They send a contingency to Jesus and say, please, please, please come back. Lazarus is sick. He ain't going to make it. 
And Jesus says, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. He's just asleep. And by the time Jesus gets back, Lazarus has died. And Lazarus' family is sideways with Jesus. And their lack of faith broke his heart. And he wept. I wonder if... Uh, I wonder if my lack of faith ever broke Jesus' heart. I wonder if I ever thought a need in my life was too big, too bad, too far gone. I've prayed with thousands of people. I'm a preacher's kid. Been in the ministry since I was 19. Do you know how many hospital visits I've, I've, I've made and prayed with people? in faith but when it hits home you know three months ago I found out my 77 year old mother had breast cancer scared us God has moved miraculously I mean God's been with us through this whole process she is cancer free and, and God has touched but it's amazing when it hits home because when it hits home, it's a different kind of faith. I wonder if my lack of faith ever hurt him. Well, it's the same thing as the true that if the blood of Jesus can make what is unclean clean, then we have to learn because Lazarus is there that it is also true that the power of God can make what is dead live again. It's just the truth. I've seen God do it a million times. I've seen him breathe life into a marriage that the world has pronounced dead. And it lived again. I've seen him do it in businesses. I mean, I think sometimes instead of showing that we have authentic, real faith, what we'd rather do with our big needs is just treat them like weekend at Bernie's. We're going to heaven. We'll just take our Lazarus with us. We'll just prop him up in the corner, put some sunglasses on him, an old golf hat. You know, when we go skiing, we'll pull him behind the boat. We'll just, we'll just keep him with us. I mean, we're going to heaven. Let's just drag him with us. Instead of having the faith that God is bigger than our biggest, baddest problem, more powerful. And the power of God can make what is dead live again. Then... We, let's, let's go back to this, the story. Then we have this lady. Start reading at verse 7. While they were in Bethany, the home of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume, which she had poured on his head as he was reclining at the table. When the disciples saw this, they were indignant. Why this waste? They asked the perfume could have been sold at a high price and the money given to the poor. Aware of this, Jesus said this to them. Why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. When she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for my burial. Truly I tell you, wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. And here we are, Traveler's Rest, South Carolina, 2,000 years later, telling her story. But why? Why was it called beautiful? This bizarre little story. They're in a little room. They've just eaten. And this lady comes in with this jar of perfume. If you, you know, you study. Other gospels say this, this perfume was worth a year's wages. Expensive perfume. I don't spend a lot of money on smell good. I don't know about y'all. I really don't. This morning I'm wearing Rolo. Is anybody familiar with Rolo? Hey, $7.00. Smells like polo. Rolo. 
If not cologne, it's toilette water or something like that. But $7, just keep spraying it. Just spray it a bunch. But this perfume this lady brought was worth a year's wages. You know, in a tight space like that, even if it was very expensive perfume, and even if it smelled phenomenal, too much of something, even if it smells good, can be overwhelming. It can, it can bring a stench. It's like Thursday night in the altar at a middle school camp, at a middle school youth camp, when boys for days, because they've been swimming in the pool, have not bathed, and they just keep spraying Axe body spray. Just keep spraying Axe body spray. It's a very unique challenge. But this room small they've just eaten this woman comes in breaks this jar and Christ calls it beautiful well there's a couple reasons why he called it beautiful number one reason is if you study this you'll understand that before the blood of Jesus Christ had made what was unclean clean in this lady's life she was the town whore and every person in that little room knew it you look at a first conversation with Jesus in scripture it's around a water well she begins to try to evade Christ but he lovingly just confronts her not confronts her but he lovingly won't let her and it, she ends up accepting Christ coming to Christ and now she's chosen as the lady of every lady on earth to anoint him for his burial That's a proof that the blood of Jesus Christ can make what is unclean clean. One reason that he called what she did beautiful is because she did not let the failures of her past stop her from what Christ had called her to do in her present. I run into Christians all the time. It's like, it's like they, they think the kingdom of God is a hockey game. They keep putting themselves in some kind of penalty box because of something they did. Every time they make a move or try to get close to God, the, the enemy just plays a YouTube in their brain and, and they go right back into the status of being defeated. It's almost like they try to help Christ punish them. That, there's a theological issue here. That's called penance. When you try to punish yourself for your sin, that's called penance. Here's the problem with trying to pay a penance. Penance says when you try to punish yourself, what you're telling Christ is what you did on that cross is not enough and you need my help. And I promise you, Christ does not need your help to forgive you, to redeem you, to set you free. What he did on the cross is more than enough. And if you're going to try to help him or you're going to live defeated, because of something that he's already forgiven of you, you of, then you might as well have shimmied up the cross and spit in his face. Because he it is enough. Where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. His grace is sufficient in our weakness. His strength is made perfect. He is able to do exceedingly and abundantly more than we can ask or think. His, through His blood we are made more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. It is enough. What you need is to adjust your faith because this woman got to a point in her faith where it was more important to her what Christ had called her to do than what people were going to say about what she's doing. Because of her past, do you think she didn't know the nature of men? She knew when she walked in that room they were going to be indignant. She knew they were going to have something to say about it being her that was chosen to anoint Christ for burial. But you know what? She had beautiful faith. The kind of beautiful faith that's more concerned with what Christ is calling us to do than what people are going to have to say about it. That's a beautiful point in your faith. I love y'all. I do. I love y'all. I, I, I come to this church every chance I get and I'll preach my heart out. 
I, I do, and I promise you this. Your opinion and, 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 and your, what, what, what you think, I do value it. I do. Whether you give me an attaboy or go jump in the river, I value what you think. But I need to tell you this. That next Sunday, I don't know where I'll be. Next Sunday I'll be in Virginia. And I'm going to be preaching with passion and fervor, and I love them folks too. And whether you think I did good, bad, or indifferent, you did not call me to do what I've been called to do. And I love you, and I value what you think, but I'm telling you, you can't detour me. You didn't call me to do this. You can't distract me because I am about my Father's business. I'm focused and fixated on what He has called me to do. I love you. The next reason that I think Christ called what she did beautiful is she only had one thing on earth worth anything, and that was this jar of perfume. I was on a missions trip one time in Siberia, a little country called Tuva. Kazil Tuva. Tough, tough, tough trip. Cold. We spent a week riding around in an Army Willis Jeep with a, a, a language barrier like you cannot believe with an interpreter. We, sometimes we had to have two interpreters. We had to go through two languages to get to where people could hear us. We couldn't eat any of the food in the country, so we took 150 pounds, three 50-pound bags of potatoes, and we boiled skint and boiled potatoes every meal for three meals a day for nine days. Can you imagine how nasty boiled potatoes get after about meal number 25? I didn't eat french fry for two years when I got home. It was a tough, 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 tough trip. I, I, I'd do it again if God called me to do it again, but I hope he don't. I was ready to get home. You ever been ready to get home? You ever been ready to get home so bad your bones ached? I was ready to get home with my wife. I'm going to bring my wife if I get to come back. i got to bring her. She's a school teacher. It's hard for her to come to school here, but I've been telling her about your church. I want to bring her. You'd love my wife. Y'all, I'm 6'4". My wife is 5 foot. <laughs> I don't call her sugar. I call her sweet and low, y'all. She's that tall right there. And got an Alabama smile, make a puppy pull a freight train. I love y'all, but I love her so much more than I do y'all. It ain't even close. She is my number one favorite person. I was ready to get home and snuggle up to my wife. I was ready to hold and smooch on my babies. I was ready to come home and get 12 crystal cheeseburgers. Now, I don't need no fries. I'm good on fries. And get some chili and dip them cheeseburgers in that chili and wash it down with a chocolate shake. Never forget it. It's tough. So we, we got to fly back from Kazil Tuva to Kresnyarsk, Siberia, Kresnyarsk to Moscow. And at Moscow, we're supposed to go to JFK, JFK to Atlanta, and they pick them up at Atlanta, and we're going to Phoenix City, Alabama. I'm ready to come home. We get to Moscow, we're coming down the escalator, and there's some dudes down there holding our names on a sign. I look at him, they're going to give us the royal treatment. They ended up being our travel agent. And he said, we got bad news. We, we boogered your flight plans. You got to stay another day. You might as well have shot, gut shot me. He said, well, we're going to make it up to y'all. We're going to send y'all to Zurich, Switzerland. I didn't want to go to Zurich, Switzerland. I wanted to go to Phoenix City, Alabama. So then they start trying to make it up to you. They start selling it to you. You know how they do. They said, Zurich, Switzerland's where they make the finest timepieces on earth. I said, it sure ain't. I look at that right there. That's a Timex Iron Man watch. I had one on when this happened. So I paid $27 for it. I've had it 11 years. I've washed it in the washing machine, run over it, left it in the woods. There's no way there's a better timepiece on this earth than something you pay $20 for it last 11 years. Then they said, oh, well, that's where they make Swiss Army knives. I've never understood a Swiss Army knife. I'm a dude. I like knives. I like guns. 
I can skin a buck. I can run a trot line. I like knives as much as anybody. Never understood Swiss Army knife. It's got a corkscrew on it. It's a survival knife with a corkscrew. Has there ever been one second of your life where you were in a bad situation and you thought, man, we could make it out of here if we only had a corkscrew? I mean, has there ever been anything in your life you thought, my gosh, if I had a corkscrew, my life would be better? Well, well, who needs a corkscrew? I've only found one use for the corkscrew on a Swiss Army knife. When you open a can of vine of sausages, if you will take that corkscrew and run it down in that middle sausage and ease him out of there, you won't tear 10 of them up trying to get that middle sausage out. I have broke the tine on a plastic fork trying to set that middle sausage free. They said, we're going uh, to tour Zurich. I said, I don't want to tour Zurich. I want to go lay down quicker. I lay down quicker. I wake up quicker. We're going home. I get right to the hotel. I'm missing Wendy so bad. Can't call her. I mean, we had to send the word that we're going to be a day late. There's a little old perfume shop right by the hotel. Got a big blue twisted bottle of perfume right there in the front. Had a an atomizer on it. I ain't never bought no smell good had no atomizer on it. I got one on my Roundup jug, but I ain't never bought one for any smell good. I had $280 in my pocket. It was $220 for that big blue twisty bottle of perfume. That's so out of character for me. But I was missing her. I bought it. I brought it home. She just squalled. She loved it. She would just walk through the mist. You know, I thought, that's how we give what's precious that we own to the Lord. We give him a Lord, I'm coming to midweek service. Make sure you get this on YouTube or God tube and strike up the angel band. You ready, Lord? I'm going to bless your socks off. Lord, I'll be back next week and I'm going to give you two but you know what the simple truth is? He's not interested in your sh -sh -sh. And do not buy into the lie that's going rampant through the church that you can do this in chapters, that it's progressive, that you just kind of keep releasing a little bit of your heart every year. That's not how it works. The reason that he called what this woman did was beautiful. She had one thing on earth worth anything, and it happened to be a jar of perfume that was worth a year's wages, and she broke it and poured it on him all at once. And that's what he wants from you and from me. He don't want part of our heart. He don't want us to ration a little more of our heart every year. He's not really even interested in the part of our heart we've been holding on to. He wants your heart. Wounded, broken, flawed, handed to him all at once. It's all in. That's the kind of faith he's looking for. And if we do that, he will call what we did beautiful. Stand with me where you are this morning, if you will. Just stand with me just a second. Stand with me and bow your heads.